Investors look to spell diversification in their portfolios with the letters R-E-I-T. We will discuss how this 1950s vehicle has evolved. Plus, the terms disruption and technology seem to go hand in hand. We have an industry expert to help us understand what it all means. This is 7 Day Yield. Welcome to 7 Day Yield, I'm Mitch Rochelle. And I'm Haley Zimring, and here's what's trending. According to PwC's Mid-Year Deals Outlook, extreme equity market volatility, choppy debt markets, and global economic uncertainty have all contributed to the dramatic decline in deal making in the first half of 2016. Through the first five months of the year, both U.S. deal value and volume were down approximately 40% and 20% respectively, compared to the same time in 2015. That said, companies with stable financial positions are still looking at M&A to accelerate growth, but investors believe the deal market has the potential to pick up through the remainder of 2016. Our next trend gives insight into the future of pharma, with retail pharmacy companies facing shrinking reimbursement, stiff competition, and consolidating industry. Many are tweaking their business models in search of new sources of revenue. This comes from a recent report published through PwC's Health Research Institute, which notes that while flu shots, strep tests, and ear exams are all helpful menu items, consumers would embrace even more services if they were offered. The study says that pharmacies of the future will be one-stop shops featuring on-demand services and digital health tools with transparent pricing. Well, our last trend is sticking to the topic of digitization. According to a new report from the International Data Corporation, IT spending is forecast to grow from $2.5 trillion in 2015 to more than $2.8 trillion in 2019. North America is said to provide the largest share of global IT spending, with the largest expenditures coming from the manufacturing, banking, and telecom industries. Each are expected to deliver more than 8% of spending throughout the forecast period. Seven Day Yield senior producer Lydia Morris recently sat down with PwC partner Julian Korb to discuss IT's impact on the asset management industry. We've seen a lot of increase in the use of technology in the financial services sector, and we hear the term disruptors. What does it mean to be a disruptor in this space? The concept is really coming from the big high-tech and software companies who have invested in services and products that are actually financial services. And these services and these products are disrupting the traditional life cycle of financial services firms. And they're really disrupting and creating a change in that environment. Hmm. So I read in one of our PwC reports that in 2014, I think there was a reported $12 billion spent on fintech specifically, compared to say 200 plus billion that banks have invested in IT worldwide. So where do we see that number today? And do we expect it to increase? The number keeps on increasing and the pace of the growth is actually accelerating. So for 2015, we estimated this number to be $22 billion. And, uh, and we believe it could actually grow by up to 50% in 2016. That's astounding. Indeed. So if we shift to consumers for a minute, and we look at the sharing economy as we've seen with cars and taxis and hotels, are we seeing that trend translate into the financial services industry with, with FinTech? Absolutely. So with FinTech and what now, now the traditional institutions are trying to do is they're trying to capture more of the customer attention through new technology and new services. And the sharing economy is another disruption of that traditional service where there's the concept of peer-to-peer -peer financial services. So specifically in high uh, volume transactions environment like the payment uh, systems or lending environment, mm -hmm. consumers are starting to lend money to each other or to create uh, applications that are really customer to customer payments without going through a traditional bank or a tra traditional institution. That's really again another s series of disruption which is impacting the financial services industry. Is there a risk that that's actually going to be taking away business from the traditional banks and other financial institutions? It is. It is actually taking away business fundamentally since the traditional financial services firms do not need to be involved in many of these peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very interesting trend that we see today and, and the way consumers are leveraging technologies on their day-to-day -day life is actually impacting the way they are borrowing money or making payments and they can actually use this technology to actually 
uh, pay and uh, borrow money differently. Mm -hmm. So consumers are really driving the trends here in terms of the technology space. Absolutely. So how are companies leveraging that to help drive revenues and profitability? So a lot of companies are investing in analytics and big data solutions, mm -hmm. trying to capture information about their customers, their behaviors, what do they like to, to do, what do they like to, how they like to be connected with the uh, institutional, uh, institutional firms. Um, do they want to receive information on their email or as a phone call on their fa Facebook page, for mm -hmm. example? And so uh, many of these actually uh, information that our, the banks are, or the insurance companies are collecting actually driving new information about the customers that would help them to drive a new way to distribute their products, a new way to distribute their services to better reach the customers who are, want to have a different level of interactions with their, their banks or their insurance company. Right. Well, I guess one of the things, and, and if we have time for one more question, you know, you can't talk about technology without addressing cyber threats and cybersecurity issues. So, you know, where do we see that sort of impacting whether or not companies want to continue investing in technology and, and where do we see that going forward? Really, the investment in technology is a must-have for companies, right? They need to actually attract customers differently. So what happens is they're suddenly creating a new set of vulnerabilities by creating an ecosystem of electronic exchange between the company, their customers, their suppliers, and, and other partners potentially. Mm -hmm. And each of these connections create a vulnerability and, and a way for uh, a, a hacker or another institution can actually penetrate that company and, and actually create a breach in their systems. And so what happens is really a significant increase in the number of incidents. We estimate since 2010, to we have seen more than 66% growth or increase in uh, cybersecurity related incidents being detected by um, our, our clients, and, uh, and so the companies need to b better protection. So there are significantly more investments in the cybersecurity solutions to protect and detect uh, such breaches. And Gary Melter joins us now. Gary, with the focus on earnings, is it difficult for managers to allocate the capital to IT spend? Th they don't have a choice. I mean, I think if you're looking at issues of systems, deferred maintenance, their focus that they need to have now on compliance systems, risk, digitization, a number of things that Julian just went through, there's no choice. I mean, in order for them to kind of stay, you know, fit for purpose and state of the art, they are allocating the capital and they're going to continue to do that. So how do they strike the balance between back office IT spend and sort of customer facing front office IT spend? Look, I think both are very important. Right now with what's happening with a very low interest rate environment, they're all looking at costs, right? We know that across all businesses, certainly on financial services. So they're going to be dealing with how does IT spend improve efficiency? The second most important part, and Julian spoke a little bit about cyber, is how do systems and IT spend help improve the controls around risk compliance and other aspects that are important to them in managing you know, the risks in their business. So there, there's, there's both. The third thing probably, Mitch, would be it's all about the customer, and they've got to be focused on how do we continue to grow assets. So that's where they're you know, allocating their capital as it relates to IT spend, and we're going to see that continuing. Real quickly, is IT spend a burning platform issue for asset managers? Right I think now? it's becoming one, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. My pleasure. The REIT market is up over 16% year to date. After the break, we'll be talking REIT. Stay with us. Your daughter has a brilliant idea for her science project, and you could make it happen, right? Wrong, because you're not you. You're a cancer hospital, and your daughter, she's a team of leading researchers. And that brilliant idea is a breakthrough in patient treatment that could save thousands of lives, which means you need a diverse team of advisors helping you, from research data analytics all the way to transformation of clinical care. So you call PwC, the right people to get the extraordinary done. Welcome back to 7 Day Yield. I'm Mitch Rochelle. Over the past 50 years, REITs have owned and operated everything from shopping centers to office buildings. But now the umbrella has changed. They own things from casinos to prisons. Haley Anderson sat down with PwC Principal David Levitt to get a breakdown on how things have changed in this versatile vehicle. So let's start with the basics. Uh, what is a real estate investment trust? So a REIT is a tax-favored vehicle under the U.S. tax law. It's essentially a corporation for U.S. tax purposes, but because of the way that the tax rules work, 
So long as the REIT distributes its income to its shareholders, it doesn't pay a tax on that income. And besides not paying a tax, what are some other advantages of a REIT? Well, I think the primary one is that a REIT can provide a broad public vehicle for shareholders to hold commercial real estate in the U.S. So it gets all the advantages of, say, a publicly traded corporation without okay. the tax that otherwise is attendant to it. And a disadvantage of a REIT? Well, I think the limitations for a REIT pertain to the way it can hold property and operate property. Okay. So there's some rules about what the REIT can actually hold and what it can actually earn. Do the limitations for what it can hold have anything to do with the property types that a REIT can have? It does. Okay. So you don't want to have sort of an active trader business for a REIT. So I know one of okay. your big goals in life is to have an ice cream business. I know. Unfortunately, you been. won't be able to have your REIT own an ice cream business. So okay. it can't do something active. The real purpose of a REIT is that it's a passive investment vehicle to allow the broader public to hold commercial real estate. And that's how REITs kind of came about. So originally REITs kind of held office buildings, warehouses, things of that nature. But in the last 20 years, you've seen an evolution in the property types that REIT hold. So for instance, today in the public markets, you have REITs that are hold prisons. You have REITs that hold casinos. You have REITs that hold certain types of energy assets. The key component of all of these types of REITs is that they're holding passive property in some sense, but that property is being used in such a way of kind of an active trader business that historically you wouldn't imagine having been held in a REIT. Okay, and if it's a passive investment, does that mean that it's insulated from any sort of property specific trends or is that dependent upon the kind of REIT it is? I think their REITs are certainly sensitive to property specific trends. I think particularly we've seen an evolution of single family homes and across Absolutely. the globe and especially in the United States and we've heard about that. So today you have single family home REITs. Again, 25 years ago, you didn't have a REIT that essentially held prison properties. So REITs are just as sensitive to the broader public markets and property markets as other kind of real estate investments, except there's more diversification, obviously, as well. Okay, and you mentioned that it's possible to have property around the globe and not just in the United States. What have recent global trends done to the future of the REIT market? Well, I think putting aside what happened on Friday in England and, and sort of saying that as to what's happening with the broader markets, I think that REITs remain particularly interest rate sensitive. Okay. So in a lot of ways, people's general reluctance about REITs in an investor community sometimes had been sort of understanding the correlation between interest rates, the broader property markets, and things like this. Okay. Obviously, when interest rates have gone up, there's been a perception that real estate values and the corollary go down as well. And when interest rates go down, property values can go up. And also investment in REITs go up because of kind of the asset and class that they are. Right. So there is some sensitivities, but I think if you look at some of the historical data that some of the REIT organizations put out, it's fascinating to see that that doesn't always bear fruit. The REITs have actually outperformed some of the other sectors, financial sectors, historically. Wow. And so the S&P, I heard, has recently changed the classification and has included real estate as a separate section from financial services. Can you explain that a little bit more and how that will affect the REIT market? Sure. I think it begins in August of 2016. There's going to be a separate classification standard for REITs. So there will be a separate index that actually tracks REIT stock. Okay. So it will be separated from the financial index. And a lot of the argument for that and the basis for it is that fund managers and other types of investors weren't getting clarity as to separately track where investments were in real estate. Okay. So there may have been arguably some underexposure to REIT stock. So now we have a separate index that will launch in August that will essentially track that. Now there have been organizations that over time have also put together kind of market-based indexes as well, but okay. this is going to be truly sanctioned and everything else by the SEC. So we think that that's probably going to create hopefully more of an investment in REITs as it's, as it's tracked as a separate asset class. Interesting. And does that mean, are we going to see a larger investment in REITs in 2016? What's the prospect for 2016 for REITs? Uh, 2016 is really difficult right now. I think everybody would acknowledge what's happened with the Brexit and everything else. It's impacted both real property and everything together with that. I will say that if interest rates remain low, typically you'll still see a heavy amount of REIT investment. Okay. Um, I think that it's comparable to a bond class for certain types of investors. So, so long as it's outperforming its typical, um, typical bond comparables and yields and things of that nature, you'll still see investment in REITs. That okay. said, it's really hard to predict where everything's going to go for the rest of the year. Do you think REITs are a bond alternative? I think some people have argued for that historically. Okay. I think now with the separate index, you may see maybe a change to that. Hmm. And if you look at the historical performance, but I think for the most part, I think you can make a strong argument that's an alternative class there. And Seth Promise will join us now. Seth, thanks for being here. Sure. So REITs have historically been thought of as being interest rate sensitive. Um, should investors worry if rates go up? You know what, REITs, 
REITs are viewed by investors as kind of a fixed income product. So they're looking for yield. So as, as interest rates rise, they look to find yield other places. And so they do take their money out of REITs. What they've eventually figured out is that REITs should be driven more by the real estate fundamentals. Real estate fundamentals are in good shape. And so therefore, they've kind of put their money back into REITs, which is why they, you've seen the uptick in, in the REIT market over the past 12 months. So, Seth, a little bit of a decoupling between the way REITs have historically been performing in, in the near term and the way an index like the NACREF index performs. Should there be better correlation between those two? There should be much better correlation between the two if you think about the real estate fundamentals. But as I said, REIT investors still are looking at it as a yield play and looking for, for a return based on the fixed income aspect of REITs, right? The NACREF index, which has been up two to three points quarter to quarter in income and value appreciation, is really driven by the real estate fundamentals. Over the long term, they'll mirror each other a little bit better, but quarter to quarter, they don't always. So maybe shows like this, which remind people what the R and the E stand for in real estate investment trust, will help get right. the exactly. investors to better understand they that. They are real estate investments. They are That's real right. estate investments. Well, Seth, thanks for uh, the great insights. Sure. And thanks for joining us. On the next episode, we'll be looking at the evolution in the private equity industry. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to check out PWC's YouTube page and follow us on Twitter at the handles below. We'll see you next time on 7 8.